Hey, what's up everyone? It's Dave. So earlier today I did the 2019 goal setting Q&A uh, Facebook Live. It was my first group Facebook Live and we we did a Zoom chat with five people, all real estate investors, and then we shared the screen to Facebook Live and everything went great. It was an awesome session. We ended up talking for like an hour and almost 40 minutes uh, and it was a blast. Just one major problem, and it was all me. When you share the screen, apparently my mic comes through great, and everybody else's mic comes through like this, and you can't hear anything they're saying. Um, so, oops. But I did record the Zoom chat, but of course I didn't think about doing that until like the last 30 minutes, or the after 30 minutes. So I got the last like hour and seven minutes recorded. It kind of takes stuff out of context to not start from the beginning. So what I did was I went through, I edited out the like the primo snippets of like good questions, good answers and great advice, some solid wins from 2018, some goals from 2019. I put it all together and here it is. So check it out. This is the highlight reel from our first Facebook group live and I think it was awesome. Don, I have a question for you. You know, what would be what would be one of the best ways for a real estate investor who may not have a uh, uh, investor focused broker agent, you know, that they know, like what would be the best way for them to find one who can talk the talk and understand the market from an investor standpoint? Yeah. I mean, I think you're going to find them at your real estate investor association meetings. Um, you know, obviously bigger pockets and stuff. Um, we do, we have a meetup as well as that. We kind of, you know, host through bigger pockets and stuff in our area. Um, cause you definitely don't want to ask a luxury agent to go and work with an investor. It's just two completely different mindsets and, um, you know, it's just not going to work. So you definitely need to find somebody who understands the investor mindset, who doesn't mind making offers that are not going to work out. Um, you know, and doesn't mind working in those lower price points. Cause I think a lot of people focus on higher price points cause it's less work. You know, you sell a million dollar home, you make $30,000 right. in commission versus selling a $200,000 home. Um, so you know, I, but what I really love about investors is they typically buy more than one. And I don't know if you've ever worked with a luxury buyer, but they tend to be considerably more um, picky and emotional. And, you know, it's just, it's just a different kind of transaction. And honestly, like, you know, as much as I like to make $30,000 in one shot, it's, I won't say it's not worth it, but it's kind of not worth it. So, um, you know, so I think having that good relationship with an investor friendly agent is key, but you've got to make sure like you understand on the agent side that you're not wasting their time and stuff too, because it's easy to do that as an investor as well, looking for those deals. So. I always like to find an agent that is also an investor. Mm -hmm. right? And typically they're not in the really the buy mode, but they've just, they own property. They get it on a level that you can never explain to an agent who means well and probably is is interested in investing but doesn't have their own properties. It's a, it's a completely different. Uh, yeah, mindset. exactly. And you know that that's how I talk to my property management clients as well because you know the first thing I tell them is like I own property too. You know, so I have to make sure that those clients are the same kind of landlord that I am because if they're not, we're not gonna we're not gonna be a good fit. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to eke out every cent out of your tenants, like it's just not the way I operate. You know, if a tenant needs a plumber, they've got something stuck in the, you know, I don't, I don't question $60 repairs. I don't make my tenants pay for piddly things that maybe the tenant caused, maybe they didn't. But it, you know, to me, I'd rather build that tenant owner relationship versus nickel and dime them for things. So, um, you know, so I have to make sure my owners understand that about me, but that I also very much care about their properties. And one of the biggest, you know, expenses there are with uh, rental properties is the turnover. So if you can keep your tenants happy and keep them in there, you know, they'll last a lot longer. So. Um, question for you guys. How, how long do you, or how much does it think, does it cost you to do a turnover in one of your rentals? Like, is there a dollar figure that you'd associate with a turnover? I have uh, extraordinarily low vacancy. Mm -hmm. well, I don't mean, I don't mean vacancy. Uh, I mean, when somebody turns over, like eventually if you own enough property, somebody's going to, going to move out. I've, I've found that even just with a few weeks or even a month of, of vacancy period that that effectively cost me $3,500 in, in my market. I figure in higher end markets or bigger markets where the rent values are higher is even more than that. Well, I could see that because my, well, as I say, my average rent is probably about $1,500 for my own property. So 
you know, if you have a month of vacancy, there's $1,500 right there. You turn over a property, and even if you're just doing touch-up paint, not repainting the whole place, sure. you probably got six to $800, you know, in a house that size. Um, you know, you have to have it cleaned. You have to have the carpets cleaned. You're doing little miscellaneous repairs, replacing blinds, Marketing. you know, maybe replacing the carpet, you know, so all of this stuff takes time and, you know, and at the same time you're paying your mortgage interest and, um, you know, so to me, like I, I want my tenant moving in the week after my old tenant moves out. So. <laughs> yeah. Vacancy aside, you know, tr general turnover, I, I try to use that as an opportunity to do the things that I probably don't want to do a year from now. You know, like if there's an appliance that is failing and you know, I've had to replace it or repair it a few times, like I'll go ahead and flip the appliance, you know, in, in during that turnover or repaint the rooms, even if they could probably go another year or two, it just, it just keeps the place looking nicer. And ultimately I end up having happier tenants. So, uh, so I probably don't need to spend about $2,000 every time there's a turnover, but I tend to just to try to keep, it in a better condition. So be, be wary of any investor that says, Oh, I don't, you know, I only spend like 40 bucks, you know, on, on new batteries and light bulbs. And, and then you're like, well, okay. Not yeah. I do most of my maintenance part. ongoing. Oh, sorry. I, I do most of my maintenance ongoing. Uh, for that reason, I kind of do, it's like, Oh, the thing's failing, just replace it. Uh, and I'll, I'll do a lot of work with tenants in there. Um, but, uh, you know, it comes back to what I was talking about earlier, where a guy like me, I do heavy CapEx when I do my properties. So I really have no costs going through uh, the first, but it's only been three years. And so we talked about that profitability earlier where it's like, I, I'm easy to be like, I don't have that much turnover costs. It's like, but I know when the five year market mark hits, I'm going to have a lot of it because it's going to be all new carpets that year. Right? right. Especially if you buy them, especially if you're a guy like me who bought all, all my houses in the last, you know, 36 months or less. And so it's like in five years when 60 months, well, now I, you have all those expenses are all going to show up at once uh, kind of thing. Does that make sense? Yep. Uh, so uh, right now, my, uh, my turnover costs have been incredibly low, but I know that that's artificial. Right. Uh, it's not spread out like uh, Lucas does. It's, it's delayed. It's not artificial. I think it's delayed because you front-ended your, your capital expense by doing the rehabs on the front end, which is a, a great idea. Uh, but you just have to factor in that there will be a, a – hit later on and if you're doing the proper allocations with all your rent for mm -hmm. maintenance repairs and you're sitting on some cash like we shouldn't be doing no we should be um because of those kind of things are going to happen we should know it i'm curious how, how do you guys do your allocations for uh for e even for insurance or taxes or especially for capex and maintenance repairs i, I do a system where i as rent comes in i actually have separate accounts and like separate banking accounts because they don't like QuickBooks and I move it, the, the money over into it and I have it sitting aside. It's called a profit first system. Do y'all do anything like that? Yeah, I budget all of my capital expenses and taxes, property taxes. And I, I use a capital one account to just be able to separate right. out money and, you know, be able to label it. So everything just kind of sits in there. I've heard I don't the capital one's a good hand, bank though. for that. Yeah, yeah it's a good bank for that. they're open to that too much on hand. I'm, you know, I only have five properties and, um, generally I can cash flow stuff out of my own account, but I like to have some in reserves just in case I've spent all my money. <laughs> I've got a little bit left over there, but, um, you know, but my income's high enough that, you know, I, I can pretty much cash flow everything out of my checking account. So mm -hmm. it's there for emergencies. I, I don't have the money funnel to a separate account, but I do, uh, I kind of take the no budget budget approach, I suppose, where uh, I just make sure I have three to six months worth of expenses saved for each property. So uh, at a minimum, you know, like I'll take all the rent from one property to fund well, all the extra rent to fund yeah. three months worth of reserves for one property. Once that's filled, I go to the next bucket and make sure, and, and that can all be in the same account, but I just make sure that there's enough there that if I have to replace you know, two roofs, two out of the five roofs, you know, in the same month, I can do it. And uh, then I, I don't have to worry about dumping money every month. I, I just make sure I've got that, that bucket filled. Uh, I must do the laziest method. Uh, look, I don't spend any of my rental income. So it all sits in one account and piles up forever indefinitely. Uh, I haven't, I, I very rarely do I spend any of it. Uh, and when I do, it's always, I only spend out of that account when it's reinvestment into my business. I want to pay for my website or FinCons. Like that comes out of the, the right. account, but nothing else comes out of there. And you know, um, people always ask how much reserves do you need 
for a, a for per unit? And this is a terrible uh, question because it's it's it scales downward as you uh, right. scale upwards. As you scale. So, yeah, and so uh, Lucas has that's a pretty good way to do it, where it's like just have six months for everything. That's what the bank is going to ask you for, right? Um, and you should have more than that. Uh, I know what you're saying like you should have at least six months, but then probably even a you probably have more than that uh, just for in case. And but I wonder if there's a good formula you could make, say five thousand dollars. I don't want to say it like that because it depends on the property, the price right. of the property. But say five percent of the house price per house diminishing by five percent per unit. So you'll need 5% on the first one. And then you'll need 95% of that for the second one, uh, kind of thing where that's probably still a little over, but probably good for the first 10 houses, say. Right. Mm -hmm. I see what you're saying. I mean, that, that's exactly what I did. So the, my very first house, I tried to save up six months worth of expenses. But then after five houses, I only need three. You know, so I don't keep six months because that's ridiculous. I'm not going to spend that much money ever at once. But it, three months is plenty to cover all of them because I'm not going to have all the houses vacant at the same time. I'm not going to have all the roofs fail or all the appliances fail at the same time. So they kind of go to cover each other. And you're right, it, it can be a diminishing percentage so that you need less per house the more houses you have. I do the exact same thing Alex does where I have an account and money goes in. And then in theory, money doesn't come out, uh, except that the theory does not always play out. Um, you know, so I'll, I, I'll use it for direct mail and all that stuff. Um, but I, I also have, it's like, I'd have to look at percentages, probably 15% of my paycheck that just automatically shoots into that account every month so that I'm mm -hmm. just dumping capital from rentals and that, that way when I'm get the itch to go buy a new camera for my YouTube channel or whatever, at least it's, it's justified. It's and then for accounting, I can say like, Hey, look, it was a business expense cause it's for the business and it came out of the business account. It's easier checking, mm -hmm. but I like the different checking account idea because I'm a big fan of like, I have one bank that my spending cash for the envelope system goes to, and then everything yeah. else goes to a different bank. And I don't even own a debit card for that. So I have to physically transfer and wait. Make it hard for yourself. Yeah. 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 So I like the different checking account because yeah, I'm, I'm a spender. You know, I see fancy spender. pineapple spender. I'm like, ooh, shirt or whatever. Um, that's the no self-control accounting method. I have to do that too. <laughs> it's, that's exactly. I'm, I grew up not having a whole lot um, and not in a bad way. Uh, but I joined the Marine Corps and I was like, I'm not buying off brand toothpaste. I'm not doing, you know, and I'm still, it's, it's a struggle every day for me financially telling myself, okay, there's the income and the expenses need to be here. Ooh, but you know, I have shiny syndrome. And so the easiest way for me to stop that is to like direct deposit out of my paycheck into different accounts and only have access to this one account. Yeah. I like that because the reason that makes sense is because the human psychology of putting all your money into one place, you see a big pile of money. You're like, Oh, I mean, and so we think spend it. I mean, I I've still catch myself looking at my operating account as it gets above that six month threshold. I think, Oh, uh, I can go buy another property. And like, no, I don't want any more properties right now. I want to manage the ones I have. Um, so it's, it's um, the, the whole design around that is to, eliminate or circumvent that kind of flawed human psychology some of us have when it comes to spending or making bank balance budgeting decisions, which can be, for some people can be problematic. I know it is for me. So you gotta, you gotta know yourself. So I have a question. Are, are I know at least three of you are, have employment. Uh, Lucas, are you employed as well? I am. Yeah. I, I work okay. at Cozy full time. Oh, so you're full time. That's right. That's what you said before. Okay. So um, I have the, the flip slide problem is that I don't, I have no employment. So my income primarily comes from my rental properties. And so I have to be very careful about how I take money out of that, that source of income because expenses from your rental properties are very lumpy and they come mm -hmm. in all of a sudden and you have two, two or three problems that happen. It can be very expensive, sometimes 15, $20,000 all, all told that you need to have out there to be able to, to mm -hmm. cash flow some sort of repair. But if you've been, you know, draining it with for your income to live off of you gotta be very careful which is the reason i'm very i'm very careful about that using that profit first system where i pay myself first and then whatever is left is what i get to it to spend on it's kind of the fun things that a business might be able to afford you 
Yeah, that's my fear with um with uh rental properties when people say I want to replace my income so I can quit. Well, it's more complicated than that because I have a W two and uh, I work at a bank during the day, and the costs that um the your employment is not it's not just cash. And so as soon as you get your cash replacement, it's like, do you really know how much health insurance costs, bro? Right. Do you really know how much, you know, you don't have to go there that I only go there 40 hours a week. It's not so bad for a lot of um, security blanket. Um, and I, well, I really like my job. So for me, it's not that big. It helps. But, but what, but what I think people look at is they go, I want to replace my income with the real estate. And it's like, yeah, but that real estate has a much higher overhead on gross income than your paycheck does. Your paycheck yep. is net essentially. Um, and so people, it takes a lot more in real estate to replace uh, a high level job. Than people. I think they really know, but they don't, they don't want to actually sit down and do the math where it's like, if you got a $50,000 a year job, it's like you really need a hundred grand mm-hmm. damn near net to, to equal um, uh, that real estate in, uh, that, that W2 income. Yeah. If you factor in health insurance and if you want to also contribute to retirement accounts and it, it too, um, then yeah, you, because like what, what Dave was saying, he's, he's taking 15% and putting it into his, um, his, his business automatically. And so that's his version of a 401k that he's created for himself. And he also might be contributing to his retirement accounts or TSP, whatever he has, um, in, in, in his life. And so when you go and start your own business, you, you can start your own solo 401k, but you're the only one funding it. So, <laughs> um, so you gotta make some income somehow. Yeah. Yeah. This is all part of my increasingly difficult decision that I've got to make. Uh, I got, I got two and a half years left on contract and David Green gave me this advice once. And he said, when, when your job is getting in the way of you making deals, it's time to move on. I said the same thing. Um, and so it's a very difficult decision because I love the Marine Corps and it's a very secure job. So yeah. David, do, uh, uh, may I do a shameless plug for something that was very appropriate to what you just talked about? Of course. So uh, I have a, me and Doc G have a a podcast called What's Up Next about uh, financial independence. And on the C is on December 31st, the next episode comes out, episode 10. And it's about should you quit your job when you hit financial independence? And several guests, including the White Coat Investor, talk about that in quite a bit of detail. And it's a really interesting question because that is the, kind of the heart of what the financial independent movement is about is okay, you get there, but then what? Yeah. I really liked your episode on uh, with Doug Nordman and, and Collins about uh, raising kids. Uh, mm-hmm. I listened to it while I was, I wasn't running, I was cycling. I went for a bike ride and had it on, listened to, listened to it, just kept riding till it was over. And I, I really liked it. Cause that's a difficult question I'm wrestling with. So same format. I'll definitely tune in on the 31st. Can I steer the ship a little bit? I want to hear about some 2018 wins. Yeah. I wrote some down and I don't want to go first. So I want to hear some. <laughs> uh, I went and with, we won't count my big deal. Um, I bought a 10 unit for 5% down out of pocket using seller financing and bank financing. And I've already in the first year recouped my initial investment. So I'd so that would be a hundred or like an infinite um, cash on cash return uh, for subsequent years. So assuming that it stays the same, stays the course. I, I did that with three evictions, including one guy who was convinced he was going to die in the building, um, which we didn't want to evict, but we were like, Hey, uh, I can't let you die in the building and you stop paying <laughs> rent. So um, please go live with your family. Uh, and then he ran into my roof with his U-Haul. So I had, I had three evictions. Someone took out the roof with the U-Haul and I still, made i think it's like 500 dollars short of getting back my initial cash investment so uh hopefully the future looks a little bit better than u-hauls and roofs and stuff and it, uh, it continues to be just that good but did you start your podcast this year or your video cast man i started my blog my youtube channel my podcast it's actually on podbean now um every single thing that anyone has seen on the internet started this year uh, all sparked out of in fact he just joined right now mr brandon turner is on the uh, facebook live uh, <laughs> a lot of that goes out to him uh, we were having dinner once i started a blog and we were having dinner and he was like you should do this and i was like yeah yeah maybe and then I talked to other people and they all said the same thing and it was like, I should do that. Um, So all of that, it's all unmonetized and it's all for fun. But yeah, that whole thing started this year. So I guess that's a win. 
Nice. For now, but it, that could change soon. And yeah, you're already rubbing el- elbows with Brandon Turner. So hey, I mean, <laughs> life's good. The blogging, that's a big one. Uh, or having your uh, own online presence rather than, you know, ha- just having a Facebook page or Twitter or whatever, but having your own um, content production. That, that's, that, I think that one you'll look back and be like, that one, that was bigger than you're giving it credit for. Let's see, 2018 win. Um, I hit a big financial milestone, net worth milestone. So I was pretty excited to see the ticker go up on Mint. Um, although with the recent stock market pullback, I'm not sure where I am now. So <laughs> hopefully still over that, that threshold. Don't check it again until it's up. I won't. <laughs> I won't. Is, is that, are those in qualified retirement plans or taxable accounts? Um, so I have, so my husband has a 403B, he works for mm-hmm. the state. Um, so we max that out. We used to max out our Roth IRAs, but we are now above the income limits to be able to contribute. Um, but we still have the accounts, of course. And then I also track the net worth, uh, for the rental properties that I have. And I try to be very conservative on what I think I could sell it for, and, you know, minus expenses and stuff like that. So, yeah. So if they're in qualified retirement accounts and you don't, plan on touching them and to, or, or doing the creative techniques to pull them out early. Um, I actually just have turned them off where I just do not check them. I mean, it, it is, it is like, I think of that as a different vertical good idea. Of, of my, because I am, I'm not going to make any, any good decisions based on the, the chaos of, and the volatility of, of the market. If you I'm believe so in indexes or whatever you invest in, let it ride. I'm so boring. Everything's in VTSAX and Me too. automatic contribution. Uh, and that's it. I'm not going to change it. Uh, don't look at it. Right. <laughs> don't worry about it until you're close to retirement, yep. uh, about five years out. It, 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 that's my um, non CF, CFP advice. Yeah. <laughs> also, because I know nothing, that's just what I do. <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to face market. the market anyway. So you you'll get yeah, exactly. the market. I figured just case. leave it alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, for 2018, big win. Uh, I invested in my first apartment syndication passively. So uh, that's my first step in getting into that world of large apartment complexes. Uh, I'm excited about that. Uh, It's going well so far. And uh, another big win in 2018 was I moved my family from Portland, Oregon to Denver, Colorado. And it's like the best decision we've ever made. It it just is wonderful here. We fit in so well. And it just was a good you know, personal decision. Um, and I, I'm seeing my family thrive, you know, I haven't seen that in like 18 months when we were in Portland. So, um, morally that was, or, um, it was just such a good win. And then I think for 2019, I, I really want to dive deep into apartment complexes and really uh, learn some stuff, you know, like you, David, like probably crash and burn once at least, but uh, I want to learn from that. And I want to, uh, see what I can do about getting people together to lead a syndication possibly. And uh, I've, I've already taken the steps towards the last quarter of putting my entire business under a series LLC, which is something that I've, I've avoided for a long time. I've avoided like paying the legal cost to, to get everything set up as a anonymous LLC run by, a, you know, a, a trust and then, and making it so that I'm, basically invisible. And then if somebody wanted to sue me, they'd have a hard time finding anything, um, any money there. So, uh, you know, we'll see how it goes. It's, it's been about two months in the making, but, uh, I think it's a really good decision, especially if I plan on growing, uh, as aggressively as I do. So I think it's taking some money and, and investing in yourself and making sure you're protected is, you know, from a business standpoint is no different than putting deadbolts on, on a door, you know, it's, it's security. So uh, that's a lesson I've had to learn the hard way and I'm finally paying for it, you know, doing it the right way. I set out to buy three houses long distance this year. I wish I didn't go last now. Um, uh, and I, and I hit them pretty easily, which was disappointing in, in and of itself. Um, I started helping other people buy houses, which was a weird turning point for me. I realized that, I don't know, for an ego perspective, it's kind of like, you know, if you're good, you can make money. That's an ego boost. But if you're so good, you can make other people money. Um, <laughs> that was kind of a, I helped some other people buy some houses pretty charitably. So that was, that was an interesting experience. Uh, my blog really uh, took off in a way that I didn't expect. I started that technically in late December, 2017, but this is the first year I've worked on it. And um, 
I was really surprised by that. I really, if, if people ask me what I, what I recommend for the year in terms of lessons, like that's it, start, start writing. Um, it really, I mean, I don't, you, I, I, Paul's seen it because he went on that, when I was at FinCon, he's like, hey, let me, uh, let me sign up to your newsletter. And I was like, oh, I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you, Paul. I mean, <laughs> I was so, but that, that really, that really was a big thing. Like I changed that website and then I, uh, I got on the Bigger Pockets podcast. That was a big win for me. I just recorded Joe Fairless last week. Um, it went terribly, honestly. Uh, but that was still a big deal for me. Um, but that website, I can't believe how much uh, credibility that buys you in the marketplace. Um, you know, I know what I'm talking about, so it's not just, you know, it's not all an illusion. Uh, but it's surprising. So in 2019, I continue, I want to work on some of these abstract things, like you talked about, Lucas, where I want to work on the business more with things that scale, exposure, learning, uh, networking, rather than just setting goals for how many units I want to buy. Because as we talked about from this whole podcast, like that's kind of a mismetric. Instead, it's like, what are the what are the roots that I need to grow this business where the units will then take care of themselves? Uh, mm -hmm. Meet the right people. I really want to do a syndication. I have about, I have a bunch of people. We should talk, because I have a bunch of people lined up. We started okay. marketing for uh, off-market deals. Um, we got the money lined up. I've talked to some syndication lawyers. Like, I... I Let's talk. That's yeah, awesome. so I've been working on that, and so I really want to do that. But again, it's like, I'm not going out there and searching the deals every day. What I'm doing is I'm trying to bring in people that know how to find off-market deals. Right. That's my goal is to work on the thing that scales, which is um, finding the right, you know, building network, networking, going to more conferences, writing more, freaking reading more, and, um, and working on the, the infrastructure rather than just how do I do the transaction. The transactions are easy. Everybody knows this. But the real estate transactions is not the hard part. It's putting the, putting the deal in the, uh, putting, you know, I explained to somebody that a, to buy a single family house takes about, to do what I do, takes seven people, agents. Uh, property manager, contractor, uh, insurance, title. It's like it takes eight, eight, nine people to get a, a simple real estate transaction done, even if you're paying cash and it's easy. And so a big multifamily is even bigger. So it's not the transaction that's hard. It's getting the eight people all to work well, to play nice together. And so that's my 2019 goal. Play. Your goal is to play nice? No, actually, I take it back. I take it back. I never want that on recorded. I want to be meaner in 2019. I'm going to hold that to you. No, fuck you. No, never. Alex was also on my podcast. I know that that wasn't big enough to make his 2018 win. No, I'm just saying. I was, uh, I was on a Do You Even Blog podcast. That was my first one. Uh, actually, my favorite one has been David, to be, to be fair. Uh, that was the most fun because he has the lowest standards. You know, he wasn't really expecting anything out of me. He just let me rant. Oh, it was beautiful. <laughs> I was half hung over. Oh man, it's perfect. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, that's that's. I'm gonna like record. I'm gonna publish this whole thing on YouTube, and there'll just be a blank spot there where Alex just. <laughs> and then all you get is the best podcast ever, and then yeah. nothing for a while. Just see this. I've been very grateful that um, I've been very grateful for the that people that that gave me exposure that. I don't know. It it must just be the hair because I, I I'm I'm certainly not the most successful real estate guy out there. Um, I think you're successful despite your hair. <laughs> right on. <laughs> so, oh man, but, I might be losing my mind. But Paul, did we hear you yet? No, mine are so. that I had in a full year, the 2018, the whole year, I was unemployed. Um, I'm now permanently unemployable. Uh, I I will can never go back. And so I have to put that gauntlet down that if something doesn't go right with all of my investments, I got to find a way to make money without having to work because it's for the birds. I, I got to tell you, um, I, I much prefer working on my own projects that some of them make money, some of them don't. Um, but I, I now have the life where I design my life and then I find income around it versus the flip, which is what most of us do. We go and find work because we need to, to pay the bills and then we fit our life around it. And so I'm actually writing a book about that. That's coming out in a couple months. That's going to be talking about how to the process to do that and the different pathways to do it. Because I, I'm not religious on that. You, you need to use real estate or, or, or else uh, there's a lot of different pathways to get there. And so it's been kind of uh, the culmination of 2018 has been codifying the lessons that I've learned in my process so that I can put it to paper, start a podcast, been on several other podcasts, like what you guys have been, been doing. And I enjoy this life so much more. Uh, I don't really, I didn't maintain many of the friends that I had 
or, or the colleagues that I had from the working world that I was in for 17 years and not because they were bad people, but because we just have different goals, different mindsets. Um, the mindset of most employees is that they're order takers and they're all mostly good people and they have good intentions and they're trying to take care of their families, but they don't have a, not all of them have a growth mindset, especially right. when it comes, when it comes to money. Um, they may have growth mindset in fitness or something else, but they don't when it comes to money because they're so accustomed to not all of them, but most of them are accustomed to getting a paycheck. And I've learned a couple of things that, um, you're not paid for your hours. You're not, you're paid for the results that you create in the world. And if you can create results for more people, then you can get paid more and, and do it at the service of others and not at the expense of others. That's kind of my big takeaway for the year. You know, I, uh, I have a, an in-between and it's kind of where I'm at where I don't feel comfortable enough to quit my job. I could and not work, but again, it's like, I want a healthy level of, of variance. And so I think there's an interim in between the, the point where you're like, okay, I've established some financial freedom and I can see on the time chart where this is going to be able to let me quit for good and feel, and feel comfortable about it. But in the interim, when you're like, you have just enough freedom where you can basically tell your boss to go F off but you don't want to in this period, what you should really do is, is do it, what you said, Paul, which is start designing your life. And what I call find a job. You, uh, you need to be able to afford to find a job you like. Yes. And so if you, if you are going to a job, I like my job. I would do it for less. Okay. I'm not going to say that on, on recorded uh, air, but I, I would do it. Uh, I like it genuinely. And so uh, if I could go in there and do that job uh, without the bits I don't like, I would probably do it no matter what. So, but I, but it took me a long time of saying no to other jobs and having the confidence, the financial confidence to say, I don't need to go pick a job, right? Cause what happens a lot of times is you get, you lose a job or you want to quit and you're like, dude, I need, now I got, I got I need money. I mean, the time is ticking. And so you go and find a job and you're stressed. And then you basically go to an interview and you beg for that job because you need money. And so when you can afford a little bit of flexibility, then the whole dynamic changes. You can go, you're like, Oh, I'll take my time and find a job I really want. And if, and if it's not the right fit, I can, t I can say no. And so then the whole dynamic changes. Find a job that you genuinely like or have a genuine interest in. Hopefully you do have this. And then in the interim, you can, between the time where Paul is, where he's like, okay, um, the F you money, I'm really not going back. There's nothing you can do. I'm never doing it again. Um, but I think that's an interesting thing that don't, people don't talk about. They talk about financial freedom and they talk about wage slavery, but there is an in-between. Some people do like their day-to-day. -day. Yeah, I feel like I'm right there because, you know, while I'm not working for somebody else, I work for lots of other people, you know, all of my clients and stuff, but I've gotten to the point now where I can be super choosy about who I work with. And, you know, if I feel at all like it's not going to be a good fit, I'm not desperate for the money. I can just say, you know, break ties and move on. Um, you know, if I feel like they're going to be a, a time suck or an energy suck or an emotional suck, you know, then I can refer it out to somebody else and be totally, you know, totally fine with that decision. So I'm super picky about the clients I choose to work with. Um, you know, sales and property management, you know, and it's, it's a good place to be to not feel like you need the money and you need every client to who's willing to work with you. It's good, good spot. Yeah. As someone who's slowly trying to inch his way towards, towards that mark of being able to choose, I think like people hear financial independence and they think of like done, I'm just going to go chill. Um, but that's most of the people that I talk to who've achieved it. I mean, they still even uh, we'll use everybody. See, everybody in the world knows Doug Nordman. Um, so we'll use him as, him as an example. The guy is doing very well, um, you know, and, and he's doing well because of what he set up for himself. But everything he does on the side, he does for fun. So he still blogs because he likes blogging. He still, you know, he teaches surfing because he enjoys teaching surfing. And he does all these things that some some people could consider as work, but just because he wants to, and that's just who he is. And there's a lot of people out there that in in our in the FinCon niche and in the independence niche that they have jobs, but they're they're their own jobs. So I my my looking at it is I want to retire to only work on what I want when I want to. And and to be able to choose. And there's this guy, Bedros Killian, he's a big uh uh, owns a bunch of, he owns like Fit Body Bootcamp or something. Um, he's a big entrepreneur. He's kind of coming up and uh, he talks about having, he has like 200 phone numbers in his phone blocked. And the mentality is like, I'll contact you if I want to talk to you. Um, and I don't necessarily think that like blocking everybody's great, but I think about how much time I spend dealing with phone calls and things that were thrust upon me and, and not things that actually matter in the big scheme of things. And like right now, I'm sure when I get off and look at my phone, I'll have text messages or phone calls about Monday or Tuesday, or this needs to happen, or we need to take care of that. Or so-and-so did something wrong. And now he's, you know, and, and that's all a part of leadership. Sure. In the military, but there's a lot of stuff that 
man, I look forward to being able to just say, nope, I'll talk to you when I want to. No more, no more imposed stress from things that just aren't in line with your goals. I think that freedom and that control is what people really want, not just sit around in their underwear and be a bum. Although I can do this in my PJs, which is killer. So yeah, which one of you doesn't have pants on right now? <laughs> if you watch my Instagram, you'll see most of my podcasts end with me posting on Instagram, like another podcast in PJs. Uh, <laughs> Good name for a podcast. And I, I like this. I'm probably going to try to do like once a month, like a group of people talk type thing. Cause it's just fun. I also, one of the things as we talk about 2019, I want to do is uh, a legitimate mastermind group. So I've kind of piddled with it here and there and it, it's worked somewhat. It's worked, you know, but I haven't like found the right group yet where it's been consistent. Um, and I think that just this right here, like hosting a meetup out here is a, like, that's like a, one of the highlights of my month because I get to be around people and network. Uh, and every time I get around people, whether it's on a group chat or in person or like tomorrow I'm doing uh, I posted it online. I'm going to sit at a coffee shop from eight to 11 and just said, come one, come all, come talk real estate. I'll be here all morning. Um, and hey. just try to do that. So Alex, I expect you to be there. So, uh, actually, um, check this out. I do this. I've done this in two cities now, and this is never, uh, this is advice I never hear. And man, it has worked for me. So in favor what I did was I started meeting with my, uh, investor buddy who ended up becoming my partner. And on Fridays we would just get lunch at the same place every week. And that was it. And then and when an investor hit me up off Facebook, I was like, yeah, come to our little thing. Two, three, six, right? And I was like, now some of these people became my partners. Some of them lent me money. Some of them I help buy houses. Some of them are going to go in or have pledged money for this uh, multifamily next year. When I got to Las Vegas, I said, you know what? I'm going to do this on purpose. So I would just find some, you know, investors that I don't pitch anything. It's not a, it's not a RIA. It's just me getting coffee on, Saturday, on Sunday mornings. And so I do it at like 8 a.m. on Sundays and I call people up. And then, so now that we have, once I did the, the bigger pockets thing, it's like 12 people. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's just a meetup and it's just come one, come all. Oh, we need a bigger place. Guess what? One of those 12 people has got a place that they can help me out to, to scale up. And so it's, um, it's been really interesting and it's a really good way to network with people locally. You don't sell anything. You meet them. I do most of my networking off BP and I just go, Hey, you're in, I know you're new, fairly new in town. It's usually people that I can, that what I call, I can be a close carrot for. I can, you know, Hey, they're trying to buy their first one to five. Well, um, I can help you buy the first one to five. No problem. And so, Hey, and so, yeah, come on out and hit me up on Sunday mornings. I have it on my little, on Facebook at Desert Rat Real Estate. And, and so, but that's really good advice. Like doing it, you get one person to have coffee with you once a week or drinks on Friday night and it can turn into real good networking. Thanks, friends. Appreciate Thanks, it. Guys. Thanks, guys. Good to see you guys. And happy new year. Happy new year.